Yeah, we didn't invent digital fur technology until uh, until Cats 2019. Took us a little <laughs> bit, but we got there. Well, I mean, that's why the gorillas all have buttholes. Yeah, release the butthole cut of Congo. Let's. I demand. <laughs> If we could do this for I, a Tom I feel like Hopper that film. starts to change the genre of the movie, though. <laughs> Welcome to Certain Point of Views, another past podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another past podcast. I'm Case Aiken. As always, I am joined by Sam Alisea. Hello! And we have a returning guest uh, from the Infinity Podcast. We've got Scott Thomas. Hello, everyone. And for the sake of this podcast, you can call me Herkama Honoka. Free now from the chains of Ceausescu, traveling the world and doing good. Oh, okay. Welcome. <laughs> and if you got that reference, you know what movie we're talking about today. <laughs> today, we are talking about... The 1995 gorilla movie, Congo. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Otherwise, I am so excited. Tim Curry tries a different accent. (laughs) So many people try accents. Delroy Lindo tries an accent. Ernie Hudson tries an accent. A lot of accent flexes in this movie. So many. Yeah. (laughs) So many. Never sure where any of them are from, but so many attempts. (laughs) <laughs> I, I remember when it was coming out and the the excitement around it was that people were hoping this would be the next Jurassic Park. Yes. And, and I got swept up in that hype because if there is one thing I enjoy talking and thinking about more than dinosaurs, it's apes. Mm-hmm. And, the, the, you know, the, an idea of, okay, we got good gorillas, we got bad gorillas, we're going to be doing a gorilla movie, but it's based on a novel by the same author as Jurassic Park. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm down. And it's, uh, you know, it wasn't commercially successful. Well, it, it did fine in terms of numbers, but then it was critically panned. But it's a lot of fun. Like, rewatching this movie, I'm like, this was a, a good, fun movie. Yeah. Yeah, I want to say that people criticized the the practical, the fact that it was puppets and the practical effects for the uh, gorillas. But, like, honestly, like, I really appreciated it. Maybe because we live in such a CGI world now. <laughs> I was just like, yay, puppets. And it's clear that, like, Armani, to to build off of what you're saying, like, our modern lineage of gorilla movies builds off of what happens in Congo, right? We may be doing CGI with Planet of the Apes and Matt Reeves' entire trilogy, but you still have Andy Serkis doing the mocap. You're still going back to this movie, which said, we're going to put someone in a suit as the ape. We're going to let a character be Amy, a person be Amy. And we're going to trust that that works and that the audience will buy in to a certain extent. Because I read for years that Crichton wanted to get this made, but his condition was, it's going to be a real gorilla. A real gorilla. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I found a, a quote that he said to Steven Spielberg when I was doing some prep for this. Have you guys read about the interview that, uh, that Crichton gave about this movie when he talks about meeting with Spielberg to pitch this film? No, uh, no. no. T- tell us. Good Lord. So apparently Crichton was really shopping this around and his condition was real gorilla. And that meant he met with the finest of the finest, including Steven Spielberg. And Steven Spielberg said, I would like to do this as an animatronic. And Spielberg said, quote, I've had a lot of success with mechanical creatures. And then Michael Crichton responded, yes, Steven, but this isn't a fish. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> And I mean that that of course would be the earlier like pre Jurassic Park because that uh, yes he wasn't attached to the movie by then uh, but it's just so crazy to think that like I mean he then went and did animatronics for that and obviously you can't just get a dinosaur but <laughs> right yeah but it's like it's fascinating because like because that conversation wouldn't have happened because uh, like they were shopping at what in the the late eighties so like in eighty yeah. eight sure in ninety four no they that, that conversation would have been like I, I trust you Stephen you you make good choices yeah let me look at the last ten movies you made okay you seem fit for this job yeah, yeah that's in crazy uh that, that that's just a, a crazy element I gotta say I I actually really like Amy the ape in this movie I th- like I I think that it when she moves around, you can see that it's a person in a suit. But I think that the face works pretty good. There's a lot of stuff going on really well. I dig it. There were a couple points where I'm like, oh, it's weird that they keep saying mountain gorillas in this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, because And I figured, oh, that's the buzz one. It's like they're, they are the rarest 
of the gorillas. It's only a few hundred. They have like 650 is like the stat I think they show at one point in the movie. And I'm not sure what, where it currently is, but they're super endangered. They're also infamously the biggest of the gorillas. So it's like, okay, that's also like, all right, yeah, sure. There's probably buzz going around. So they keep saying mountain gorilla. And I kept thinking like, oh, it's weird that Amy, she looks like a lowland gorilla. And then I, I'm like looking it up and it turns out that the, they were ordered to base her off a of lowland gorilla because it was quote unquote cuter, and I am just so proud of myself for identifying <laughs> that difference. <laughs> oh my gosh! That's when you know you're the target audience for this film. You're going into oh, seriously. 100%. I, I also loved it, the fact that like Hollywood was still like, like Hollywood was like, let's make it smaller so it's cuter. Like it's just so. <laughs> It's so on brand. Yeah, I mean, this was a good era of gorilla suits, though, because like this is around the same time as George the Jungle, which mm-hmm. was actually a pretty good gorilla suit. Obviously, it's a comedy, and so yeah, you can, like it, it's more anthropomorphized. And this is only like what, like two years before, maybe three years before the uh, Tim Burton Planet of the Apes, yeah, which you know is like fucking like the movie is terrible. We talked about it here, but the special effects are amazing. Yes, and I think you raise a really interesting point, which is that. We relatively in this podcast grew up with movies that were employing this tech, right? We went on a run of gorilla suit movies. And so I wonder what it's like for people who are in, you know, their early teens or college years looking at this. Are they going, what the fuck is that? Why wouldn't you just Andy Circus it, you know? But for us, mm-hmm. this cinematic language was established and, and this was sort of the start of it. Like you identified actually for quite a few years. Believe I remember reading somewhere, uh, this was a while ago, that part of the reason they decided to go with more practical effects with like a gorilla suit and things like that is that CGI just wasn't quite there with like hair, you know, like how detailed hair and movement could look um, to really create fur. And so although for like Jurassic Park and other things where you could add CGI, um, you know, making a smooth dinosaur was one thing, but having gorillas with like actual textured hair was just too hard and it it just didn't look right even when they had made a small attempt and so just for any of those young people listening that's why gorilla suits yeah we didn't invent digital fur technology until uh until cats 2019 took us a little bit (laughs) but we got there well i mean that's why the gorillas all have buttholes Uh, (laughs) most important things about cats yeah release the butthole cut of congo let's I demand. <laughs> if we could do this for I, a Tom I feel like Hopper that film, starts to change the genre of the movie. Though. <laughs> Amy scared. Amy scared. <laughs> <laughs> when Amy like goes off with the 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 tribe of gorillas that they encounter, or, or pot, or whatever the term is for for it, I should know that. Um, but, yeah, yeah, there's a moment lowland where it's just like gorillas and highland. You know, mountain and lowland, but you don't know what a group of gorillas is called. Yeah, I know, I know. It's called a Congo it's of gorillas. Is weird, and like 300 years ago, people went on a tear, just coming up with different names for every type of group, um, as opposed to what any logical language construction would do, which is just have a name for group and then that's it. Like, yes. it's a murder of crows because people were being cute yeah yeah it's a trouble of sagittarius's which is not a real thing i just made it up right now and it's a congo of gorillas i think that's we could just call it that that works i i sure i just googled it it's troops it's It's troops troops (laughs) nice yeah that that, i that's also someone being cute because that's that's playing with the gorilla like gorilla gorilla kind of thing right there yes yeah that's adorable (laughs) Anyway, I, so I, I, I turned to my partner and, and I joked, oh, you know what this means? Like, she's not a virgin anymore. <laughs> like, because, like, you know that that's what the deal is, like, yes. going on here, especially because of, like, how gorilla troops function, where you have, like, one primary alpha male and a, a harem, effectively, is, like, their social structure. But, yeah, I, I'm picturing when we talk about, like, the CG to versus, like, like being able to handle hair, like the progression of like the Donkey Kong Country games. Yeah. Uh, like if you remember the first one, he's got like weird triangles for fur. And then the, by the time they get to Diddy Kong, uh, Diddy Kong's quest, like there's more noticeable fur design in there. Like, yeah, it took a while. Like 
even the even the more recent Planet of the Apes movies, uh, I would say that the only one where they actually start to actually feel like they're part of the scene, even though the acting is amazing in the first two, is is War for the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Like that one, I was like, oh shit, they've integrated it perfectly. Like that actually looks like fur is being covered with snow and like they're actually in the, there in the moment. Like the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, for example, is great. I love the, the performances going on there. Side note, if you're ever watching that movie, turn off the subtitles. And watch the first 15 minutes of just apes doing sign language with each other. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, but it, they never, it, at any point when they're on screen with a human, feel like they're in the same room together. Like, it's just, the, the, the CGI just wasn't there yet. No, it, and, and you bringing up the video games is a really interesting point because I remember for years I used to grow up playing Madden, NBA, all those games. And the reason those were so uncanny valley is, especially in the football ones, the second people took off their helmet, you saw the hair that was meant to be on these players, and you were like, well, that is not Jay Cutler. That is not <laughs> Brett Favre. That is an abomination. That might as well be the Babadook. Like, this is <laughs> not at all a person. And, I, and, and, the, and that we were, we were right on the cusp of that era of technology really making its way into movies. Like, it's, it, those video games are easily the precursor to The Rock in Scorpion King. Right, where him making his big movie debut is just this slab of CGI. Who the fuck is that atop a scorpion's body? And 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 I think that like largely speaking for Congo, it's why the movie is a breath of fresh air. Still, it it's not exactly the last gasp of an era that goes out of style, but it's it, it's the end credits in a way on like practical effects as the primary currency of what Hollywood special effects are meant to be. Like this is right before we hit Independence Day and that might be the the zenith and from there I feel like we start we start yeah. moving more and more into CGI stuff. Yeah, I mean we're only 4 years out from the Phantom Menace. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So I I guess like part of it is that at the time when this movie came out like Jurassic Park was the first like oh shit CGI can look real because before that the most uh, impressive things people could show were like Terminator 2 where it's like oh look how good that like cool effect of this the liquid metal is yeah. but no one thought it looked real it just like looked really interesting and like I and groundbreaking like this it was just spectacle to be there Jurassic Park was a clever combination of animatronics and CG and proper lighting which is a thing we'll talk about uh, that did a really good job of making it all look cohesive and and of a world it, it was the same as like the you will believe a man can fly kind of scenario where it's just like oh yeah like sure it's still a movie but like it you 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 buy in yeah. mm-hmm. and people were really excited about that and then a year later you get this movie which has a similar pedigree um and people were hoping to be equally wowed and instead it's all people in suits yeah and what's wild to me about the movie is that like, whatever you make of the gorillas in suits, and again, I like Amy. I have more mixed feelings about the guardian apes themselves, especially on this watch. Yeah. I never minded so much as a kid, but going back and watching it and prep for this, I went, oh, oh, yeah, okay, the seams are showing a little bit. That seems to be the thing that most people remember because, as you said, they were excited to see gorillas. They were excited for this to feel real. And what's wild to mm-hmm. me is that the first three-fourths of this movie still feel very real as like kind of a group of adventurers with Amy as the outlier, but she's still real enough. And so this kind mm-hmm. of glorious B movie that takes us into the jungle, maybe in search of a hidden temple, maybe in search of laser tech that's going to help comms groups like that still crackles with the same energy that Jurassic Park had. I'm not trying to create an equivalency between the two in terms of quality, but that really up until the Guardian Apes, it mostly feels like it's going to be in the pocket of that reveal. Like you, you do think they're going to earn it, I think for a pretty long time. Yeah. I think, I think part of the thing is that even though you can tell Amy is possibly a, well, she is a person inside of the gorilla suit, her character feels real to you and her relationship with her handler feels real to you and even just to everyone else in the space. So you can kind of like excuse 
a little bit of like maybe this isn't real because she starts to be fleshed out as a character. You know, she has things that she loves. She has things that she doesn't like. She definitely wants to smoke a cigarette. And I like these like nice touches. And, so then and drink her green drop drinks. Yeah, her green drop drinks. She just needs one to take the edge off. I mean, and who doesn't? Amy is relatable. Hashtag relatable. Yeah. But then when you get to the guardian apes, they're, you know, just like these like this force of unexplained protectors of this space. Because, I mean, like, you know, maybe they're territorial, okay, but like, wh- why? Like, you know, you know what I mean. Like, what is it about this space? What is there something there? I think that this movie, especially in the second half, well, third part, has a lot of questions that it like is never going to answer. Just like it's never going to answer, and then they just pop up, and so therefore, like, you see them, and they don't feel real to you because there is no characterization. There's nothing. It's just clearly people in suits attacking other people you know what was a bummer for me like so it, it's stan winston doing the special effects on this and like the work is actually really good like when they get shots of like the faces of the grays those they're actually a lot of detail going on in it um like so i appreciate a lot of the artistry but the the gorillas don't look big yeah, like they don't feel strong. They don't feel like I, I, th- I think there was a vibe to try to have them be kind of like wolves or like or like the raptors if we're going to make continue Jurassic Park comparisons. Yeah, um, as opposed to what kind of what we think of gorillas as being, which is just fucking huge. Uh, it, it, so you don't get that element of it. And because they're so well lit in the, in the finale, yeah. you see them very clearly. You see them in size comparisons with people and like they look like that they're human sized things walking on all fours. Like uh, like the, the ferocity of them, while it is conveyed sufficiently that like as a kid, yeah, like didn't really think about it too much. It was just like, yeah, they're surrounded by, by monsters. Okay. Uh, they happen to be gorilla monsters, but they're they're monsters. They aren't particularly impressive. Yeah, yeah. And that's what kind of makes them not work as like the, the principal antagonist. I, I think a lot of that has to do with, like I said, the lighting, and a lot of that has to do with camera work. But I think that they could have <laughs> made them bigger. Like they could have exaggerated their physiques. Honestly, they could have they could have used stilts. Like if you're building the costume anyway, you know, mm-hmm. like like get them a little higher off the ground. Get them a little. You know, get them arm extensions. That's that's classic yeah. puppetry too. Like, so it's not something that was like not invented yet. You know, that's not something that's like beyond the, uh, the knowledge of performers at that point. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I imagine they have some of that going on, but it's just not very pronounced. Well, and a, a point that you guys are making, and it ties back case to your reference to Donkey Kong Country, and maybe this is why I'm jumping to it, is this movie sets up the gorillas to be the final boss. Like, that's really their purpose. We meet them at the beginning. Nice screenwriting, right? All the things that are going to show up in the movie happens in the first 15 minutes. John Patrick Shanley, Tony and Emmy winner, knows his stuff. Still can't believe John Patrick Shanley wrote this movie. Like, one of our great modern dramatists. But that the movie is a series of escalating obstacles that are meant to build to the gorillas. And they serve as the final boss for every single quest in this film. Whether it's Homoka questing for the city of Zinj, whether it's getting the tech back or finding out what happened to Charlie, whether it's getting Amy home, the gorillas are the final boss obstacle. And then you see them be ostensibly kind of shrimpy. Like they're basically the size of um, Stephen Graham on Boardwalk Empire playing Al Capone. And you're like, this is not what I thought I was promised. And it doesn't really live up to the expectation of a final boss, you know, like, it, yeah, you're, that's because we we don't really know that much about them. So if they're going to serve as something that creates dramatic tension, the visual, the way that they move has got to be the thing because the story, the lore isn't really there to, to string us along. It's it's dumped off in the movie's back third, but it's not really there from the jump. Yeah. I mean, hear me out. I feel like they're a suicide cult. Um, because they did jump into that lava. I love so, that. Yeah, just, it's so weird that they just jump in. <laughs> just, I feel like just making my own like head cannon for them. They are a suicide cult. They really like the diamonds because that's going to bring them closer to their death and their doom. And they've just been waiting for that volcano to erupt, and uh, someone interrupted their ceremony. I feel like that's <laughs> a really possible thing. I was just like, wouldn't animals run from this lava? Come on, guys. I mean, listen, if I had existed 
for thousands of years just to have my final purpose being killing Dr. Frankenfurter, I would think about jumping into the lava too. I'd be like, oh my God, this is what I waited for. This was pointless. Yeah. Or maybe it was just like mission achieved, but like super let down. Like, <laughs> like wow, now that all my goals are done, what am I going to do with my yeah. life? I guess, I guess we're done. I kind of love how much we have, like all the things that we've talked about that are sort of the issues. I actually have things to address in my pitch, which I can't wait to get to. Great. But before we do that, I do want to move on from the apes. Um, just because that, like, they're so they're they're going to be something that we're going to talk about no matter what, uh, quite a bit of because they are the the hook for this whole movie. Yeah. But I do want to call out attention to some of the actors because uh, we were talking about the, just the amazing cast that this movie has. Um, and I'm going to start with Laura Linney. Yeah, who, she's amazing. Uh, yeah, like she. I, <laughs> so I, I had a note or uh, uh, as a thought of like, oh well, what if like. Um, we had some sort of element of using Amy's backpack to power the laser. Um, that would have been like kind of an interesting thing, like her like sort of working things out. And, and I say this to my partner, and then she's like, "No, no, because she's completely prepared for everything. This whole movie, you shouldn't have to have her improvise. Like literally, she's got everything under control from start to finish. It's just every now and then she's like." this part's going to be hard. Can you help me? But she sees it through up to the point where she has a hot air balloon to get out of there. Yep. She has air conditioners, mini air conditioners. This woman is so prepared for everything in life. Like she's just like fancy tents, mini air conditioners, like all the tech in the world. Like one of the statements is, wow, you really know how to pack. (laughs) Like that's something someone says to her. I love her character. I think that she's great. I love Laura Linney in general. I think that she's great. Um, I did think that it was like, like there was like a weird interaction. Like, you know, like the first, the first time they meet um, her and I uh, can't remember his character's name. This is Dylan Walsh. Uh, Dr. Dr. Peter. Uh, th- like, you know, they, they kind of have that fun moment of like, doctor, doctor. And then when she tells him that like, she's like, her her PhD or doctorate is in technology. He like kind of like makes fun of her, but I was like, but aren't you like using virtual reality and like technology to like voice like help your gorilla make a voice? <laughs> like what what is going on? Why are you making fun of her and her tech degree? <laughs> that was weird. It, it, it's a fair thing, and and also because she consistently presents as being so competent, like. Any reason to make fun of her should go out the window in the first two to three minutes. And it's actually one of my favorite moments in the film is we find out that she's in the CIA. And then the film doesn't mm-hmm. keep harping that. It just continues to show us why she probably excelled in the CIA. Like, when your plane is under rocket fire, go use the flares to distract the heat-seeking rockets. Like, what a moment. Yeah. What a fantastic Laura Linney beat. Yeah, a re- like real cool sequence. And like every point after that, like continues to have her be on top of her shit. She's like like what I love and uh is that in comparison with with Peter Elliot, the the, the primatologist who it, you would think if this was like an like analogous to like a Jurassic Park that this would be Dr. Grant, you know? Yes. Like but he's not prepared to exist in the wild when he gets a leech on his dick she's just laughing at him along with everyone else like it's it's kind of wonderful that she's just she fits in she's like she's competent she she has the best tech and she's able to do some of the coolest stuff and she's the one who sees it everything through like yeah he's he's very naive and altruistic about a lot of things and and a nice thing is the movie doesn't overtly force any of its characters together too quickly you know like i think that it's It is copying from that Jurassic Park template in which we understand that Alan and um, what is the name of Laura Dern's character? I can't remember for the life. Ellie Sadler um, are together, but it doesn't really give us explicit moments of physical intimacy. We see like the relationship developing between Peter, between uh, Laura Linney's character as it goes. But it never forces the moment like in a, in a worse movie, the leech thing could have been too cute or the, the thing in the tent could have been too cute. And it really lets them kind of just be at opposite ends without forcing the tension to go one way or the other for 
really most of the movie. I think it's a credit to Shanley, actually, who's really smart about that stuff. The most on the nose scene is like when the monkeys are all talking. Yes. Or are all making their like sex noises. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they're joking around about it. Like that's the flirtiest, like outright moment in the whole movie. Yeah. And, and even that is like a, a lesser movie would have had that just that would have dovetailed straight into some happy fun tent time. And, you know, it doesn't. Mm-hmm. It, it, it holds off, which is a nice thing. And and not very yeah. emblematic of ninety of other nineties blockbusters like Jurassic Park and Congo are kind of more the outlier there, I think. Yeah, maybe if it was a little bit later in the movie it would have felt more like it would have gone the way. It's a little early for them to like actually hook up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's just like it's so nice having this like such a capable female lead who like I said, is not only prepared for everything, uh, is able to execute on all these plans. Like she came off to me like Doc Savage mm. in this pulp fiction story that they are presenting. And the crossover that they're doing is with like someone like a Tarzan or like an Alan Quartermain, and that's Monroe. Mm. Yes. Uh, played by Ernie Hudson. And oh my God, like he's not doing necessarily a great accent, but he is doing a very charming one. He is very charming, and I really appreciate that he is like, when the shit hits the fan, he's like, all right, so we're leaving, because that's, I mean, I probably wouldn't have ever gone, but I really appreciate that he assesses the issue and goes, all right, everyone, (laughs) let's collect everyone and leave. And and talk about, like, a fantastically progressive character for 1995, too, in a way that I never clocked as a kid, but this is a character that was originally intended to be played by Sean Connery that gets to be played by Ernie Hudson, who's a person of color, and a guy who is fully aware of himself, both being an outsider and being like a low-status man of color when compared to a lot of the white adventurers who have come before him. And not only does he acknowledge all the cliches about it, jokes about it, but then like when he gets rageful at Tim Curry in that moment where Curry maybe or maybe not is going to let something slip, you see all his pride you see fury like there is mm-hmm. so much that's active about this character from a from a racial perspective that i'm like you didn't have to go that hard and it's awesome that you did like that is it, it, that's a, a a more what's the word i'm looking for it's it's a sharper angle on the character than than i had remembered as a kid and was really happy yeah to see it's it very there. he's it's very nuanced and layered and I, also i i going back to you saying he's progressive he also like never at like, there's never a point where he, like, doubts Laura Linney's character. Like, he's never like, no, no. Like, I yeah. like he's an authority on what he knows, but he never, like, talks over her or talks down to her. He's yes. never like, listen, sweetheart, I'm your tour guide through this. Like, he completely believes that she's capable, and he knows where he kind of uh, has expertise which is like more with like the natives and things like that and like maneuvering the jungle but he completely allows her to have her expertise so like his character all the way around is very progressive no you're right G- game recognizes game the sexiest moment in this movie is when monroe grabs the, the second flare gun and is like right next to her and they're both like lining up their shots together um and like they're not faded or because like no one actually like gets together in this movie but like they're not they don't feel like they're necessarily like faded to get together in the way that like some movie characters do but damn is it there it's just this like swashbuckling energy for the two of them deflecting fucking missiles with flare guns can can i be real every single thing ernie hudson does in this movie is sexually charged i had in my notes that like (laughs) <laughs> rawly sexual moment when Amy goes to or uh, Amy goes to confront him and he looks at her and just takes a cigarette and puts it in her mouth I was like good lord that's charged I'm like I, I'm not making that up right that is a sexually charged moment and it's just like everything he does in this movie is laced with come at me energy it is yeah, well, he does know that she has some uh, some sharp teeth. <laughs> I, you know what? I think that he's uh, very supportive of her, too. Like, she clearly wanted yes. to try that, and he allowed her to. Another progressive moment. Yes. Th- this man is, is boundaryless, and we respect a king who is boundaryless yeah. in his ways. And it, uh, also, the funniest scene in the whole goddamn movie, when... Uh, after the mountain gorilla like makes its stand against uh, against Peter, uh, and he like turns around and like like Monroe was standing right next to him, and all the other people were right behind him, and they're all just gone, and he just like pops up out of the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I I could talk for ages about how successful this movie is as a comedy. I think this movie is legitimately hysterical. The the mm-hmm. encounters with the um the the regime, everything from the interrogation with who is Kafka? Tell me. And the coffee and cake sequence with Delroy Lindo. Like, oh yeah. Yes. This- <laughs> that scene rules. <laughs> Um, and, and that actually sort of is a good transition into a character who is definitely comic relief in this movie, which is Tim Curry as Herkimer Homolka. Like, he's a little bit of a Bond villain, but it doesn't, like, he never is actually threatening to anyone. Uh, he's more just sort of like this weird con man buffoon kind of figure. With an obsession. This man is obsessed. He's obsessed, like, like comically so. Like, there are times where people are like, it doesn't exist. And he is like a tantrum response like it does exist. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like honestly, he's yeah. The character's hilarious. Well, and you guys just both in your description hit on what makes him so great, which is like imagine a Bond villain with an oral fixation who's going broke. That's this character. And that if you told me that James Bond was gonna like fight someone who was on the phone with the bank, being like, I just need another hundred tile for this laser. I just, seriously, I need a hundred thou for my laser. Like, I'd be like, sign me up for that Bond movie. I'm there. And having Curry, this guy with this such gravity, but also the skill to play down when he has to in this role, it's delicious. Every single thing he does and says in this movie, it it drips. It's so good. Yeah. I mean, uh, Curry's like... He's so good. And I love all of his facial expressions always. Like, you always know exactly where you're going to stand with him, like which character you're going to find, <laughs> like by the beginning of the movie, right? Like, so, cause even the moment you see him and he's in the lecture hall, you know, he kind of signals to you with his eyes that I am more than you think and possibly evil. <laughs> like, and he does that because that's what Curry does. Like, he's just like, all right, I'm going to tell you, wink and a nudge. Truly. I'm I'm looking right now at his IMDb to see like what his run of projects was leading up to this because in my head I went did he come off of Muppet Treasure Island and do this film like did Curry go from that to this and the answer is yes he absolutely did that's exactly what he did it's of course yes <laughs> and right after that he did Gargoyles so he basically cements himself in our childhood and lives with like this run of stuff. And and don't worry, the other thing he did right before that was Sonic the Hedgehog playing King Acorn. Oh, and Mighty Max and Dinosaurs. Like Tim Curry was just carving a path through the pop culture. Well, that a lot of that's him as a voice that we that we will absolutely remember because it stands out so much. But then also remember right before that was Home Alone 2. Yes. Yeah. Oh my god, he's, of course. Yeah, he he was all over our childhoods. Like Tim Curry was like a very big part. Like yeah, I see his face and I still feel like immense like oh Tim Curry even though he spent a lot of time being villainous. <laughs> but still. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's exactly right. And that's exactly right. And like for all the classics like Hunt for Red October and right before that Clue. I mean, it's he's one of those I I often reference this article that was in premiere magazine when we were growing up about what was going to define a movie star in future generations and the thesis was it's going to be the movies that play on tnt all the time because those are the ones that's going to lodge itself in your brain it turns out that that was half right like for us tim curry is this beloved star not because he was in the biggest or the best projects but because he was in so many that we digested as kids in a short amount of time and that legacy is less likely to leave our brain than some of the stuff we're ingesting now because it was a foundational building block of the nerddom, of the analysis that we're doing here today. Yeah, just yeah. just in general, just like, yeah. So I'm going to pivot away from the main cast for a moment to talk about the other sort of comic relief character in this who is criminally short in his appearance, which is Joey Pantaleone. Or P- Pantaleone. Yeah, they can't pronounce last names. Uh, Joey Pantoliano. Yeah, I can't do it. Wow. Joey Pants. Joey Pants. I can't say it. <laughs> it's okay. I'm infamous for not being able to get people's names right. And so I just call them Matthew McConaughey. So it's, you have my support. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. I can't believe I just tried it that many times and still couldn't get it right. <laughs> anyway, so Joey Pants as Eddie Ventro. He is uncredited in this movie and uh, is uh, one of the best parts. Like when he shows up, I'm like, I- I'm here for every moment that you're in. And spoiler alert in my pitch, he's in for the rest of the movie <laughs> because he's Fantastic. great. Fantastic. A talking gorilla. The money hairs on the back of my neck are going woo, woo, woo. How much? Oh, my God. Yeah, it's just so fun. It's it's so nice having that kind of fixer, you know? Yeah. That, that I think that's what the rest of the movie is missing. <laughs> yes. And and actually, like, the secret joy of this movie is its escalating series of character actor appearances. Like, for a while, this film is basically, it goes five or six minutes before you're introduced to another crazy character. And then another crazy character. And that's the thing you don't actually want to end. You're like, I just keep meeting awesome roles inhabited by these great character actors for about an hour and change. I think it's at the end of the first hour that we are in the plane leaving to try to go deep into the jungle. And the last thing we saw was Delroy Lindo. But that means that we met Mm -hmm. Delroy Lindo. We met what's his name from Lost as Koyiga uh, in a very early role. The guy who went on to play Mr. Echo and he was King Shark in Suicide Squad. He's there. Uh, Joey Pants. like Yeah. Joe Don Baker. Showing up as as the head of TechCom and be, yeah. just chewing the scenery. Bruce Campbell in the first five minutes of this yeah. movie. Oh, I, yeah. Like, oh, oh, yeah. D- going to talk about that one in a moment. Yeah. Um, also, er- early appearance by Kevin Graveau. Graveau. Wow. I can't also. I, last names are just not with me today. Uh, who would go on to be very well known for lots of stuff. Underworld comes to mind, but he's also an accomplished comic book writer. Yeah. And is uh, the, the scariest voice I've ever heard. Yeah. Oh, he's terrifying. And he's great in this. It's you, whatever you want to say about Kennedy and Marshall, like they knew how to cast and draw from a talent pool and they really made it count on this one. Uh, the only the only spot that I have a little bit of issue with is Dylan Walsh as Dr. Peter Elliott. And one of the big issues I have is it turns out that Bruce Campbell read for the part and they didn't go with him. And that's damn just it. goddamn silly. And damn it. That, now, I think that Bruce Campbell wouldn't fit the movie that they made. I So I have some I, I kind of I was like, I, I don't agree with you. That. I love Bruce Campbell, but I I think that he was the right kind of naive to be the the opposite of Laura Linney's character. Like Right. Bruce Bruce Campbell's jawline does not allow for the kind of soft boy that Dr. Elliot is in this movie. Exactly. Not at all. But can you imagine? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, like Dylan Walsh is secret hard. Right, like later in his career, he's pivoted to a lot of roles. Oh, in in like later stuff, like yes. la- 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 like not in this movie. <laughs> no, not in this movie. But but like later in his career, he actually pivoted to playing a lot of villains or or heavies with not unbelievable success, but with enough success that you would keep hiring him that way. And I think that's what they were hoping to tap into here. Like he he's gonna have just enough chutzpah to stand up to that gorilla and for it to be surprising. He's gonna have just enough stuff to to get through the big moments and it doesn't really materialize in the performance even though you can see the building blocks there i think yeah it's a little bit of a bummer but like it, it's overall fine i i think the problem is that uh in the movie that they made they spend too much time they, he's he's technically the lead yeah like he's, he's technically the hero of the story and that's annoying because both um dr ross which is laura lenny and monroe uh <laughs> uh which is ernie hudson like those those should be the heroes <laughs> like yes. those should be your main vocal like focal point character yeah i um, i don't i don't think that he is the i don't think that he is like the hero at all i oh he's he's not actually it's just like they frame him a bit too much as, as that like yeah i i think that she's the hero <laughs> oh yeah absolutely yeah it's absolutely her movie and it's funny it is kind of like the the 90s framework that doesn't let it totally be her movie right like you can imagine a pitch for this movie where she is where she is seen going to meet them and we don't shift perspective over to amy and dr peter and that cadre right it's like where we literally follow her from techcom to the showing because it is her quest to find charles and get this tech back that we really start with that is the main engine yeah. Um, as constructed. And, and it's interesting from an adaptation standpoint because she's more of a villainous character in the novel. Yeah. Um, and, and then Elliot is the more heroic character. So, like, he's less of of that in this movie. Yeah. And giving her an, a, a altruistic motivation to do everything makes it 
makes her the hero, like has her take it over, but like it's still like still framed like the the bones are still of him being the hero because that's where the book was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. That's another one that I I want to credit to Shanley a little bit, but only because are you guys familiar with his plays at all? Is he is he a writer you've encountered much? I can't say that, that I have. So no. jo- John Patrick Shanley is absolutely wild. He's a guy who is best known for creating these kind of off Broadway character studies. Uh, typically, like very Irish American, um, very intense stuff. He wrote among movies Moonstruck. He wrote Joe versus the Volcano. Uh, he wrote Doubt. That's probably the thing that that most merged his theater stuff with his film stuff. And so he's this guy who has always had a deep empathy for female characters and for letting them be, for lack of a better word, like. Uh, shades of gray in terms of who they are in a film, right? They're allowed to be messy heroines. They might be in the villain role, but they're not actually going to be the villain like Laura Linney is. Like, he's often been a very good writer for women at a time when a lot of men weren't writing women very well. And I think it's really interesting that he sort of spot, spots Laura Linney where she is tonally in this film and, and lets her be kind of whatever the film needs her to be and doesn't put her in a box, which is really nice. Yeah, and like and like I was saying, so I I watched this because uh, Scott, you and I had originally tried to do this a couple of years ago, yeah. and, and schedules didn't work out. Um, it, so I did a rewatch then, and I was comparing my notes from that versus then I rewatched it last night, and it, it's interesting to look at it because I, I think when I did that rewatch, I was a bit more nitpicky. I was like really trying to like find areas where it's like, okay, this doesn't work quite that well or like the scene didn't really play out versus just sort of being there for the ride on this one where oh my god it's so fun like i said it was pulp fictiony before and it really is like it like this is lost diamond minds of Sol- or solomon's minds or whatever like the alan quarterman story like right there like it's it's fun it's crazy you got you know hippo attacks <laughs> like like what more could you want yeah it's i woke up and watched it this morning and thought this is the perfect way to watch this film. It has more in common, like you said, with, with Pulp Fiction, with a Saturday morning cartoon that happens to be live action than it does with like a weighty film about science or, or even like the primal existential terror that informs Jurassic Park. It's, it's swashbuckles. It's, it's scary when it wants to be or, or tries to be scary, but it's not that, like to, to use the parlance of the times, it's not that deep, bro. Like it really just kind of like it wants to get you on the ride and for you to enjoy it. And I kind of felt like a little kid again, watching it this morning, thinking of the way I used to wake up and watch cartoons, the same exact vibe. Again, I think it, it just suffered by, because they were trying to positively associate it with Jurassic park. People wanted it to be that kind of prestige piece. And it's just not, it's, like it's a B movie and there's some, I, I feel like it's a little too earnest at times, but it, like you said, it doesn't have any of those big moral quandaries about science. Like the biggest one they have is like, is communications tech worth it? And it's like, uh, well, we know, we, we know now it definitely is <laughs> like, yeah. like those telecom companies like have way too much power. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ahead of its time in that way that, although that's something we were dealing with a lot in the nineties, right? Like even that feels yeah. a little borrowed from Skynet. Like, we, we don't have an evil artificial intelligence here, but we have a satellite that we need to operate and that we understand it would be a pretty shitty thing if the satellite went live. Yeah, like definitely some bad people would make some money. There were a lot of like things in the media in the 90s about the possible perils of of technology of that kind of communication. I mean, like the the Internet was scary, right? It was like fairly new. <laughs> and uh, And so like that whole... That whole thing, like the way that we think of the internet now, although we do know now that it is kind of scary, um, we've, we've confirmed that, but it's a different type of nightmare than what we thought it was back then, <laughs> definitely. And so that was definitely part of the book. Uh, I did read the book when I was younger. I really liked it because I liked Amy, but I don't remember a lot of it, to be honest with you, right now. Yeah, me either. Yeah, same. In my old age. Yeah, it was one of those books that I read I think that's the other thing that I remember most about this movie and Michael Crichton in general. None of his stuff was so explicit as to be scarring or kind of like reforming in terms of your boundaries. But it all was just gory enough, just violent enough, just hard science enough to feel transgressive, 
when you were young reading it like i i kind of remember going to the library and trying to check out the one dollar paperback version of congo without anybody catching me doing it you know or or asking any questions and same with jurassic park and uh, i think that's one of the nice things about this this movie is that it, it does occupy that space there was still stuff in this that grossed me out as an adult or or that i was like ooh, that hurts but but not not on the level of a jurassic park again which i've had the pleasure of watching multiple times in the last few years and i get to certain moments of that movie and i want to look away even now knowing what's coming it's it it it's rooted in something that's so much scarier at a bone deep level in the way it's constructed one thing that did gross me out and it wasn't gross me out from like a it's a gory kind of thing but uh i I didn't know how to feel when i was watching the scene is the scene when they encounter the like the ghost tribe uh yeah they're traveling and i what i mean is that i i haven't been able to find how much information uh they like actually took like did they find out about like a cool tribal thing that like fit really well or did they just choreograph a dance move um and i mean adam shankman's choreographer on this one this was an adam shankman joint yes it was oh my lord (laughs) (laughs) yeah i saw that and i was like oh fuck (laughs) shankman uh oh man that's funny but i so i i don't know if that actually answers or or where that falls like is it cultural appropriation or is it actually um good and i i don't know but either way i don't know enough and i can't tell in the context of the movie and i feel uncomfortable yeah with the sequence like yeah Agreed. it's uh it, it looks a little uh a little like look at these primitives kind of thing yes which is, yes it uh, does not good well they're doing something mystic too with their dance right they're trying to keep his soul to have his soul return to his body and so and it's it's just like is uncomfortable <laughs> Yeah, like it, it actually works is, I think, the thing that makes it like really feel that way, because it's not just like he he, he then does wake up just in time to have a heart attack from seeing another gorilla. Um, yeah. And that's what, like that. That makes it feel like intentionally supernatural. Yeah. Yeah. hundred uh, percent. So that was a bummer. And uh, yeah, like I said, even if even if it turned out to be pretty well researched, uh, I don't know, like because like I was like watching it being like or or maybe it's good that they found this stuff that was like a, a, would fit appropriately that's in the right region instead of some sort of like vague concept of Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Uh, and, and then we were sort of talking about sort of some of the weaknesses. Like we mentioned that the gorillas were like um, kind of rough, but the the finale, I, th- I think, is just generally like too well lit. You see too. It, it looks like I think the camera angles too far back too often, and you can see everything too well, and so you see all the seams that we're kind of saying. And thus, like while the actual beats I think are pretty well pretty pretty well and good um it just doesn't have the sort of visceral impact that it should have yeah uh, especially as an adult looking for something like that looking for something that's more timeless as opposed to um the movie i just happened to see this weekend kind of thing right if you want to actually like is it worth watching now when there's so much that you could watch (laughs) as opposed to just what's playing yeah i think it's a really good way to put it uh but in the end i i find it a still a pretty fun movie i i was really not mad to have rewatched it yeah i wasn't actually disappointed um, in this one, um, <laughs> you know how I feel sometimes when we're watching stuff. I thought that like overall it was pretty fun. Kind of felt like one of those classics, like you know everyone's in search of something kind of thing. Uh, and I thought that the characters were actually pretty great. And I thought that there were actually emotional beats here. Um, you know, not everywhere, but like enough that it made it worth the journey. And. Um, yeah, overall, I still think that this is like a fun movie. Like if you're sitting at home and you have nothing else to watch, if you're cleaning your apartment, you could play this and stop and watch certain moments and just really kind of enjoy your life. Yeah, totally agree. I, I referenced TNT movies earlier in this podcast, and I think this is a really good version of those. Like this is a movie where if it was playing on TV, you might sit down and finish the whole thing. You might just clean your apartment. And to be honest, if it wound up being edited for TV, there's a chance you would get a slightly better cut of the movie. You know what I mean? Like, I think it, it, Agreed. Going, yeah. it, it going in and out of commercial is not going to be a thing that hurts this film. It, it's going to serialize it even more. And that's wonderful. <laughs> I, I, would, I would love that. I would enjoy seeing this movie that way. I, I think you're you're onto something there. I think that like with some appropriate uh, appropriate cuts, uh, we could possibly have a better movie. Um, so why don't we move on to pitches? Wait, hold on. Cut. We're talking about cuts, right? So we should cut. 
so you can talk about a certain point of view. So yeah, so we'll run an ad, and when we come back, we'll have our pitches. Beautiful. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't Screen Beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential Screen Beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? But that's, no, that's not. Can I call them Screen Beans now? Fine. Screen Beans. So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole Screen Beans now. You will be mine. Aurora. That was a transition right there. <laughs> I love it. It's perfect. It was right. perfect. Don't beat yourself up about it. Matt, I'm sure you could fix this. <laughs> Why fix perfection? Why fix perfection indeed? That said, this movie was not perfect. I've got some thoughts about it. Um, and I know y'all have some thoughts about it. Scott, as our guest, would you like to take the first swing? Oh, let's see. Okay, so in terms of pitching uh, a fix for this film, I think it's a it's it's tricky, right? Because you want to talk about like what really goes wrong, what can make this more interesting in a modern sense. What I would actually pitch as the fix for this movie is expanding the beginning to the point where we get the lore for those gorillas. So I think what we want to do, like my pitch for the movie is basically have there be kind of a temple escape in the beginning of the film. What we have now is Bruce Campbell and his lackey kind of going into the temple, seeing it, and establishing that there's a threat inside. I think the more interesting to do is to make them legitimately credible explorers with an expedition. Kind of basically do a Raiders of the Lost Ark. I don't think we need the traps, the anything. But the sense that these two men, this team that went out there, is in fact quite good at what they do. They were excellent. And that we then see them lose their life to these gorillas or to a dark shadowy force. You don't have to do the reveal here. But that we basically establish that they're great and whatever was out there was worse. Because if we know that that's waiting and we maybe get hints in and around the temple of the guards, of what's coming, then we know that the thing that's going to arrive at the end is is going to be more worth our time. It's it's not going to be locked into the visual reveal of them. We're going to be worried about going back to this location that we've infused with more meaning, that we understand that whatever our heroes are going to have to do is going to have to live up to or be more lucky than what these truly skilled explorers tried to do and failed to do. And I think in that sense, it also makes us care more about Charlie, We're kind of coasting on Bruce Campbell's inherent charm and his good looks, but we're not given much beyond Laura Linney's reaction to him and his position as Joe Don Baker's son to care about whether he's alive or not. And that means that that quest of hers really isn't as important or meaningful as it can be. And I think if we're going to have those things be an instrument or engine of the film, we need them to matter. And so I would argue that we actually give it a nice expanded opening sequence that gives us this kind of rollicking, almost self-contained adventure that ends with these guards, that ends with the shadowy murder of Bruce Campbell and the guy with stringy hair, who I can't remember his name of for the life of me. And that from there, we kind of unfold the movie as is because it gives us a sense of actual dread of what's coming. As much as the eyeball thing is nice, I don't think it's enough. And we don't really get a sense of what adventuring is or what the cost of it is. We keep getting told over the course of the movie, often by Ernie Hudson in a very charming way, what adventuring is and what it's going to be like. But if we get to see it and not hear about it, I think we arrive at a more successful version of this film. And that's my most major pitch for a thing I would like to fix. Really interesting because I I have very different notes, but I I do really like that kind of uh, take on it. Like basically doing like a mini movie at the opening to sort of set up like here's what it looks like when you've got like 
the, the your usual A team. So you need something even better. You need your S tier uh, to to go out there and deal with this shit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you you need all these mercenaries and all that stuff and also a talking gorilla <laughs> yeah and then it really makes peter in over his head we see him in over his head and that works but like if you basically do have this incredibly crack weird a team that gets put together and you know because of this opening mini movie yo peter walsh is a dead man walking oh god like he should not be there then his being there is is a dramatic raise of tension just by the virtue of his presence. Like, he's the one who's going to get them killed. He's the one who's going to get them in hot water. That's kind of what happens, but he becomes more of a ticking time bomb in terms of when something's going to go wrong. And then him standing up to the gorilla would have even more meaning too because there's this notion that the wild is truly different and that only certain people can survive there. We kind of get that, but I've always thought the gorilla standoff was, as funny as it was, a little meh because, well... He knew what he was doing with Amy. And so there's at least some mm-hmm. pretense for him to be able to accomplish this in a way that's meaningful. If, if, if you cre- Yeah, it's funny in that scene, he says, uh, I've, I, I know I've read the books. And I'm like, didn't you write the books? Yes, well, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's like, like, dude, you wrote the book. Come on, bro. You didn't just read. Yeah, I read my own book. I'm good. <laughs> Right, but he can't be that badass because he's because <laughs> <laughs> he's still in Walsh, uh, not Bruce he, Campbell. But yeah, but, but that's that's the thing I arrived at watching it this time because it, it would also keep in the spirit of the pulp adventure thing, but also give genuine stake to the thing that it feels like we're most let down on, which is the reveal of these gorillas at the end, and and that even with a little bit more lore as to who they are, the appearance could be you know um, what's the word I'm looking for. A little bit of a letdown, but if we're given more reason to fear them from the outset and understand what threat they pose to this group that's coming in, the less that mistake hurts, I think. And and the more it's something we can pave over because the story will have really given us something to chew on while we wait for that to happen. Um, so that's my pitch. That's really nice. Uh, Sam, do you want to go next? So my pitch is uh, similar in a way, but different in that I would not change the beginning. Um, my, my, <laughs> my the, honestly, the biggest problem uh, with this film is the fact that the lore of this city is not really explained and you don't really understand these villains. So, um, you know, you don't understand the final boss. So what I thought was, I wanted to add a memento, maybe even a possible engagement ring that Laura Linney could like pull out every now and then, which I think would still give you like a little more, you know, like she almost married this man kind of thing like that. So it's very small moments because I really actually think that the beginning buildup of this film is pretty good. What I'd like to do, what my big edit would be is somewhere in the middle And I know that there were a lot of like really great moments and comedy and stuff like that. But somewhere in the middle, I'd like to have a nice exchange between Ernie and Tim Curry about the legends of this space. And like Ernie Hudson just being like, yeah, but I've heard, you know, about these creatures that guard it. Right. So like kind of like, you know, how like in The Mummy, you get that nice like by the campfire feel kind of spookiness where she's explaining the mythology behind, you know, what may or may not have happened in the book of the dead and all of this thing. So something like along that line, especially because both of those actors are so fun and why not? They're working so hard on their accents. Give them a moment to interact. And that's basically what I would do. I would make the, the last scene, even though it's the boss scene, I'd probably tighten it up a little bit and not make it quite as long. Um, definitely still the Charlie reveal of his body and things like that. And, um, you know, keep the gruesome, like let it be. But I would like give some more shadows again so you don't see as many seams because we're working with what we got. Yeah, that's basically it because I really enjoyed this film. So (laughs) that's all I would do. I'd kind of like put in a scene where it's like people sitting around the fire and like kind of watch like Dr. Peter Elliott being like, wait, 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 wait. I'm just here to like bring a gorilla home. Like, what what are you guys talking about? Like, (laughs) where are we going? What the fuck is happening? Um... 
and just kind of uh, and his assistant, who I love because I'm also a coward, um, just be like, no, we should we should just go on our own, like just just go on our own, like no, what the fuck, and um, and him be like, like how we're already in the middle of the jungle, we don't know where we are, like we we've got to be with these people, and kind of realize that they're fucked like they have to keep going on this adventure and so it's like basically it's a very small like very very small tweet but yeah that's my pitch on how to fix it because i loved everyone in this yeah definitely more tim curry ernie hudson scenes would have been amazing like we get a couple of them and that like they get some nice banter back and forth but but yeah like using them for exposition i think is way more dynamic than pretty much anyone else yeah i mean you can even have like richard who's the assistant kind of like bring it up like ask Tim Curry and just kind of have him just be like well you see and then Ernie hurts and be like yeah I also heard there's like a group of like super aggressive you know monsters gorillas or whatever I don't know what term he would use uh you could you could spice it up a bit and kind of have them go back and forth about it and everyone just be like okay time for bed you know kind of thing but then there's that sense of yeah. of doom You know, probably would have been better than the slug on the penis scene. I mean, like, that was funny, (laughs) but, like, you could probably cut that and put that in. Or or both. (laughs) The movie's not overly long. Uh, (laughs) Fair enough. Fair enough. Keep everything. (laughs) I don't know. I I do actually think you should should cut stuff. Um, There's a few spots that I felt were um, a little expository too soon. uh, Because while, yes, I think that this movie should be Laura Linney's movie i think that all the stuff earlier on actually is like like i almost married him for christ's sake yada 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 and then she shows up and she's like this woman of mystery um and i kind of think that that's a thing to sort of play up a bit more um so for mine i kind of see like they they want the cold open where we get the kill it's like the it's like the raptor being loaded in jurassic park kind of thing i would keep that opening pretty much the same maybe try to convey that their travel time's a bit longer like you could do a few calls but you're not seeing as much information on the other side yep. mm-hmm. um uh, like at the stateside offices but when once you get the actual murder of the fiance charles regardless of who is cast in that part because of a thing i'm about to say <laughs> but as long as charles dies I, what I think is th- that we should focus in on the eye and smash cut to the drawings of the eye from Amy. I think that we shouldn't have the scene of them getting like confirmation and seeing the campsite be destroyed. I think that that's too much information there. That's also where they like really go over too much stuff that they could have saved for later and it would have felt like more meaningful because then Laura Lenny feels like a woman of mystery and also her paranoia about the killer ape uh, feels crazier early on until you find out that she has reason to think about something like that uh so that the traveling with amy and so forth would like this was a time where pop culture was trying to sell or not, not sell but like really like make sure people understood that like no gorillas are not like wild murderous things like the the the, the 50s like the king kong kind of stuff like the, like this was an era where people were trying to be like well no they're actually like fairly docile creatures and yada 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 um this is an era where they would want to try to sell that. And you could have that feel like an irrational fear that, that Peter Elliott is trying to actually dismiss and trying to prove away. Um, and I think that would be sort of like a, a helpful element there so that like, it really feels important when we get to the actual murder saves, because that'll be a thing. Now on that note, I think this movie should be campy. I think that this movie is not campy enough. I think it's a little too earnest at times. And this is why I actually think that Bruce Campbell could work in the role of Dr. Peter Elliott. I think that sure, like he's got to be a buffoon. And I want I want us to believe that he is a master primatologist, that he knows all of his shit in his chosen field, and that as soon as he steps away, he still is like ready to be square jawed and whatnot and has no fucking clue what to do at every goddamn point. <laughs> for for this move this my movie about it. Like he's used to being Dr. Jones, but like like he's not actually able to punch a Nazi kind of thing. Like at <laughs> like at Berkeley, everyone's like everyone loves him. He's like he's the ape guy. He's got the like he's he's so goddamn good looking. He's he's so ready. Uh he's got like a, a weird Romanian philanthropist philanthropist who's like funding him. It's like, <laughs> we're going on an expedition to the Congo. And then like immediately it's all just wrong. Like <laughs> like like you had no idea what what you were getting in for. Everyone's gonna have to like carry your ass this whole goddamn time. I, I think that so we keep we keep the, the, a little bit of a focus here, but we um, basically he's a fake out protagonist. I want like Laura Lenny to ultimately be the real protagonist, <laughs> but she's like mysterious at first. And we'd like kind of deal with all that. I love the uh, 
<laughs> like I love all the stuff with the flying with like the green drop drink and all that. I want to keep that that kind of stuff. Um, and so much so that like when they meet up with Joey Pants, he stays with their crew the entire time because that's awesome. He should be with them. And I think that throughout the movie, he and Amy should be bonding. He should be teaching Amy how to play cards and like all that kind of stuff. Like I think, like I think the two of them should have a scene where they're both drinking green drop drinks like in the background because he's just fucking great. And I just think that we need that kind of thing. Like I, I think that Joey pants should be, st- should stay with the group and like four scenes that still happen, like with the ghost tribe, I feel like he should be like upfront, like trying to like haggle with them and communicate to like, get them to give permission to like go see like the dead body and stuff uh, rather than just sort of like offering it. Um, cause he feels like Quark from Deep Space Nine. Mm. Like I want someone who is able to like barter and make the deals and like feel like that the person you want as your like intermediary man. Yeah. Mm. I, ca- I, I think... kind of, mm, I don't know how I feel about that one. Go on. Well, uh, so again, I'm trying to sell sort of like a, a campier kind of thing. I want them to get to the jungle faster, which is one of the reasons why I want to cut some of the stateside stuff, get, get them out there when they, when they do the, the airdrop, I think that they should probably lose a couple people. I don't think they either say that they did or if we spend much time on it. But I think that, like, once they actually land on the ground in the jungle, we need a a tighter group because the majority of the... Like, they've got, like, eight or eight to ten guys, something like that. And it doesn't feel... um, They feel like they're lackeys. Like, we don't really spend that much time with them. I would would like them to all be bigger personalities. But who's going to die? You need your red shirts, though. No, I know we need red shirts. (laughs) But but we don't rec- but I prefer in this scenario to know the names of the red shirts. Mm, mm. Okay. Okay. The same way that in like the JJ Abrams stuff, like uh they, they kind of make a joke of it. Like all the mooks in the JJ Abrams verse, like for the most part we actually like get to know a little bit. Like there's the cupcake guy and the you know, like there's that kind of world where Yeah. Uh they you know, they're they're people. Um and they're not totally anonymous individuals in the background. What people? Um, Go on. <laughs> and then once they are on the ground in the jungle. I think that uh, after we find, we can have the scene with them on the call or like where she like, te- like checks in with the base stateside. And I think that's where we should get like a little bit more detail about the gorilla stuff uh, to start to reveal and like find out more about Laura, Laura Linney's like history. Um, I think we should have as they're traveling the, the sense that they're being watched, that there's something kind of stalking them. And the biggest point where that should really happen is right before they encounter the mountain gorillas where the mountain gorilla, like they're like clearly something is watching. You get the sort of like apish vibe to it, um, and then the big silverback shows up and it pulls away to indicate that it's like doesn't want to be like confronted with the the other gorillas. So that like okay, they're they're studying them. Maybe they're kind of luring them, um, and that once they actually arrive at the campsite, they I I think that they need to be like under little bits of attacks that sort of like push them, lead them into the temple, wherein when they come across the bodies of the gorillas that the, the, the grays have killed, it should be indicated to be like a ritual kind of thing. Like, I think Sam, you saying it's like a cult actually works here. Like the, the murderous, uh, like the, this like murderous rage that they go through should have like this, like kind of religious component to them. It should be this like very primitive, like kind of cannibalism cult where they like lure things into a pit to murder. And they, they're doing that now to the humans. Like the, like everyone who kind of comes kind of close is this way. And it's implied that they've been doing this to, to the gorillas because we kind of see that here. Then like the, the, like the, the night fight I think is like pretty good. I, I like, I love it with like the weird, like laser fence that they've got going on. And like yeah. the auto tur- turrets, like all that stuff's great. When Amy goes off to find the gorillas later, I, I, I think we should cut a little bit away from like, she goes and like talks to them. And like, I think we should cut a little bit sooner in the scene because it's like, uh, it, it looks like they're like fucking off, and I think I <laughs> like, and you'll as you'll see what we're about to get to. While the humans are being hounded by the greys, which I think should be beefed up, they should have exaggerated physiology, and they should be illuminated. It should be darker for the most part. Like we should be getting flashes of them. We should rarely see a full shot of their body, and when it when we do, it should be lit in sort of interesting ways. Like I think in the in the diamond mine, we can have lots of like we could have like disco ball lights a little bit like like if there are like fires that are like maybe refracting off in interesting ways mm-hmm. to kind of like give like dynamic lighting to it all uh but while they're making the stand against these big scary gorillas that's when amy should show up with an army of mountain gorillas i mean i dig that uh, and that <laughs> that that's the distraction it's not that she just shows up and it's like starts signing or she, sign language she's basically like, the elves that show up to helm's deep <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly. She went and parlayed with the fucking gorillas. And what I want to get the vibe is that there's actually been going on a war of these gray gorillas with the mountain gorillas. Have that actually have been like, there's actually politics going on in this, lo in this location. Um, so that when she shows up with the mountain gorillas and like, so, so cause like there's two things going on. Like, they never actually show the mountain gorillas and the gray gorillas in proximity with each other. So we never get a vibe of it. So the gray gorillas look small and I don't know if they're actually smaller than the mountain gorillas or supposed to be smaller than the mountain gorillas. I don't know how big the gray gorillas are. Like if they're supposed to be smaller, I'd like something to compare them to, to show that they're smaller or if they're supposed to be the same size. Awesome. Like whatever. But like, we should actually have some sort of perspective on what we're looking at. Cause otherwise it's just people in suits. And I, so I think that would be supportive. Also, I think that the gorillas, they keep talking about how I've never seen an animal move like that. They're so fast. And so, like, again, they feel kind of like dogs. I would like them to be fighting humans more aggressively using, like, br like brute strength. Like, I think they should be testing the, f the fences by pushing trees down on them. I think that when they actually start capturing humans, they should be using body parts as weapons. Like, they start, like, the first gorilla that shows up throws a head. I think they should, every time they kill someone, they should be, use, like, tearing off the head and using it as a projectile. I think that at one point, like, a gorilla should be over a human and rip open the body of of a corpse that they have already and have the blood rain down on the person. So they're vulnerable to another gorilla coming in from the side, velociraptor style. I think that we should have like big physical, like use the, use the strength of these things. Like they're, they're monsters and, and they're animals, but they're not like the raptors, which have like, like talons. They're not, they're not wolves with their teeth. Like they are impossibly strong and very smart. And those two co should combine in a way that isn't just, I'm angry and running around like a rabid dog. And I'd like more of the, those kind of things, but I still fucking love the, like put them on the endangered species list line and the laser and all that, like that, that ending totally fine. Uh, the volcanic eruption, maybe angle your shots, maybe put rock, outcrops in front of where the lava is coming. So we're not like focusing on it so much because the lava doesn't look very good. Um, you know, you can have like lots of pyrotechnic effects with it and so forth. Like you can look, you can make the volcanic effect look really fucking nightmarish and it, it really should look hellish if the camera angle is lower. It's, it's way too high in every shot because you just see like the lava pour out and like the gorillas jump into it. Like, and then that way Amy can like leave with her tribe of apes that she's with now which has to happen anyway. Uh, and then they yeah. get on the, the hot air balloon and Joey pants should be the one that Laura Lenny gives the diamond to throw and he makes the throw it and then actually pockets it. <laughs> and that's where the movie should end. <laughs> nice. I'm so into Joey pants yeah. walking so away again, with money. This is a big campy adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm just dreaming of uh, Joey pants having his own adventuring series where he goes from uh, mission to mission on a hot air balloon, suddenly independently wealthy wheeling and dealing. Just like right. basically, it's just basically uncut gems in the jungle with Joey Pants, but he's much less claustrophobic and he, he survives. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's mine. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I, I, yeah. I have no notes. That's like, great. <laughs> yeah. My my only objection is to Joey um, negotiating with the tribe because I feel like Ernie doing it was just fine. And mm. I don't want a white dude being my black to white translator. Like I, I, I think word. the upfront should be Ernie. I think that, like, I like the part where they laugh, and it's like, why are they laughing? Because I'm black. Um, like that's a good scene right there. I think that when they go, like, when they walk in, and the like to the whole tribe, not just to the tribesmen. I think Joey Pan should be off on the side, like making a deal. And maybe it's not to see the body. Maybe it's something else that they're doing for like safe passage or something. Mm -hmm. Or oh, I think he should be whatever. trading like a cigarette or something. Like that's fine. I think he should just be like yeah. trading tobacco. I think that's fine. I just think that like the actual like deals that go down with the uh, tribe should just still stay Ernie. He is the person who's the expert of that part of the jungle. So I just want to. I don't want to take yeah, away his I, agency. I agree on that, yeah for campiness no matter how much i like joey pants or uh, first of all i actually think that like yes it would be great to see him playing with the gorilla but i love the fact that he was like yeah no uh this is as far as i go because uh this is my level of uh this is my level of danger so uh mm -hmm. gonna go now bye <laughs> look there's something like really great about that like yeah uh, i did my part here gonna go uh gonna go find a martini I'm done. Uh, this is the airport. The airport's as far as I go. I'm out. But I do, I do yeah, like him uh, teaching uh, bad habits to Amy. That would be great. 
<laughs> yeah, I just want him to show her how to play poker. That's fair. Or blackjack or something. <laughs> it's absolutely fair. fair. It's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to, the scene where she loses and gets mad like a real gorilla, just kind of, kind of like puffs her chest. And he's like, whoa, whoa, okay, fine, you can have it. <laughs> and just like give her whatever food they were playing for because they don't really have money. Then she, then she turns to Dr. Peter and just winks with one eye, being like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the hustled's become the hustler. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, hustle. <laughs> Amy, rich. Amy, no. <laughs> Amy, see a sucker. <laughs> Amy, bluff. Amy, good gorilla. Oh, uh, last thing is the um, I want the mountain gorilla silverback to uh, give a nod to Lori Lenny's or Lori Lenny's character at the very end, just being like, "You got this. We got this. Thank you. We I, I respect you and none, none of these other people." <laughs> <laughs> hey, you you're the you're the silverback of that crew, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> game recognized game. Exactly. The boss nod. <laughs> <laughs> Any film is improved with a good yeah. boss nod. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I feel like all three of these are fun takes on it because the movie's already fun. You kind of had like a free willy moment, you know, between Amy and uh, and Dr. Peter. <laughs> go, friend, go. I understand. I was like, I just feel like Amy is going to be really upset when she can't get green drop drink. Oh, she's going to yeah. murder those apes alive. Like, I mean, yeah. I don't think we any of us, when we make life decisions, realize the things we have to let go of. So it's just part of life, Amy. Accept it. I mean, I feel like the the, the best case scenario for her is to be living with a troop of uh, of, of mountain gorillas yes. near a research site where people are studying them so that she can like walk over and be a translator between the apes and them yeah. uh, and occasionally get green drop drink and cigarettes. Yeah. Listen, uh, I mean, she's going to encourage all of those other gorillas to smoke if that's the case. And I think it's probably just better for them that that is not that what's happening. You know, cancer, Amy, cancer. I, I was going to say, so, you know, like uh, the, the, the negative side, no green drop drink. The plus side, no jaundice. There are givers and takes, you know, that it, it balances yeah, out. Yeah. yeah. She's living a much healthier lifestyle now, Case. Like, it's... It's fine. It's very ghetto. I, and also, like, she she gets to get laid now. So yeah. maybe the yeah. edge will be taken off in other ways. <laughs> 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 if you're implying that green drop drink is also a sex term, I'm here for it. I think that's absolutely. I just go to, uh, 1, I look that one up on I'm, Urban Dictionary. <laughs> I'm fairly sure. If it's not, we should add it. It does get her to say tickle Amy a lot. <laughs> Tickle me. Tickle me. Yeah, so, I I mean, like, this was the fun movie to kind of revisit. And like I said, I think we all have, like, fun ways that would sort of accentuate the strengths of this movie. I understand why the critics wouldn't really love it. It is about a sign language gorilla fighting monster gorillas. Like, I think we end up with a pretty good time. Like, if you're, if you're here for Pulp Fiction kind of stuff, where people fight atavistic uh, apes using laser guns and riding hot air balloons, then, then that's... That's what you're here for. If you thought this was going to be Jurassic Park, it's just not. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, unless anyone has anything else they want to mention about this movie, Scott, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. This was quite literally years in the making, and I'm so happy we (laughs) got to finally make it happen. A privilege and a pleasure. So you've got a lot of stuff going on, as with, it seems like, every podcaster. You have multiple shows, oh, God. Uh, uh, including one more than you did last time that you're on. So uh, give your plugs. That's absolutely true. Uh, I have two podcasts right now, and The Best Picture is where we take one movie approximately a week, approximately every few weeks, and then arbitrarily decide it won the Oscar and justify why. And, of course, you can hear me with fellow certain POV member Rachel Corky Shank on the Infinity Podcast, where we are connecting popular culture to pop comics with an infinite number of detours along the way. We're going to be covering everything from MODOK to Invincible to Loki coming up. So if you enjoyed my takes on this and bad impressions of Amy the Gorilla, who boy, have I got a podcast for you because I do not stop doing voices. That is, I just, I let, I am living my best life doing impressions whenever I possibly can. So come on over and spend some time. 
yeah i mean all, all of your stuff has been great to listen to and yeah i mean and obviously infinity podcast is probably the one that most people are more familiar with and uh it's just a uh, it's just a great show I, I love listening to it every week thank you man so. we love doing it every week it's just a great listener base and so grateful to be able to show up week in and week out and just spread some joy create some takes it's good stuff and if people wanted to find you, where, where should they find you? Uh, you can find me at OG Scotty T on Twitter and Instagram. That's where I post about all my podcasts, post about the acting that I do. You can see me on HBO and in the game Red Dead Redemption 2 and, and just have a good time. I promise it's a fun, safe Twitter space. A lot of Psyduck memes. I'm literally, I can show y'all, I'm literally wearing a die cut Psyduck necklace right now. Oh my God. Because it's I decided beautiful. to. Breathtaking. Thank you. It, eventually, you become a parody of yourself, and I just wanted to get ahead of that and lean into the Psyduck jewelry while there was still time. <laughs> I have jiggly puff earrings, so. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, Sam, where can people find you? They can find me here and nowhere else, because if you have complaints, you should find Case. Case, where can they find you? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. On Twitter, people can find me at Case Aiken. Uh, the podcast is at Another Pass. You can find us there, or you can find us at certainpov.com, which is a great website with lots of podcasts that tackle a whole bunch of nerdy things and uh, from lots of different perspectives. So tons of great shows. Uh, you mentioned Rachel, so we might as well give a, a shout out to Screen Snark, which is a fantastic show where Rachel and uh, Matt Storm uh, bring on a guest each week and they have great conversations about what's on their mind in terms of the most recent stuff that they've seen and just pop culture in general. Uh, great conversations. Uh, anyway, Screen Snark is a, a great casual conversation every time. I really enjoy listening to the the various perspectives that of the people that come on and like what's just on their mind about media. It's, it's a, a great show. Check that out. It's at certainpov.com. Also at certainpov.com, you can find a link to our Discord server. We are currently having this call on Discord right now. Uh, but just come hang out. We're sharing memes. We're talking about Star Wars spoilers and uh, arguing about Oscar picks. So, like, those are always, like, a fun time. Come, come check that all out. And, well, Sam, take us home. Next time on this show, we'll be talking about Highlander 2, The Quickening. But until then, if you enjoyed the show, pass it on. Thanks for listening to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast. Don't miss an episode. Just subscribe and review the show on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com. Without being like too intense or highly feels no. philosophical. That's the wrong. That's the wrong way of phrasing. It, that's the wrong way of phrasing Ow. that too. Um, it, it, it's all. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. It's always a great Sorry, casual Rachel. conversation. <laughs> <laughs> he messed Sorry. that up. We really like you. I know. Maybe I just like you more than Case I, does. <laughs> I love the show. <laughs> I brought it on this network. <laughs> and Case's meltdown is complete. He's red, everyone. <laughs> I. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't edit this out, Matt. Don't don't do it. Leave it in. Keep it. Post credits. Keep it. Post credits. Keep the credits in. CPOV. Certainpov.com.